Thanks. Um, okay, it's a bit out of form. I will talk, uh, no, there are no direct cones in this talk, but uh, I hope uh, nevertheless that it will be interesting for some of you working on um, particular systems in which you combine superconductors and, and other materials with spin dependent fields, spin, uh, spin orbit exchange fields and so on. Um, the work is in collaboration with uh, two people from San Sebastian and here I have to, to, uh, have to shame because uh, I use here San Sebastian, the Spanish name of the city and the previous speaker correctly mentioned this as Donostia which is the Basque name of the city, so it's one and the same city. So uh, San Sebastian is in Spanish, uh, Donostia is Basque name. So I should maybe put here Donostia, it's uh, more correct. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I will, after uh, introduction on really basic things on an historical introduction on superconductors and in spin dependent fields. And I will also uh, talk about other topic which at first glance looks a bit uh, dissimilar which is uh, a spin in normal metals, in diffusive systems. In particular systems with kind of uh, spin orbit coupling in which we know there are effects like uh, coupling charge and spin, like the spin hole effect, Edelstein effect. Today in the morning we have a, a very nice introduction on, this, uh, on these topics. And then what I want, just the goal of this talk is to bring these two fields together and show you in a, in a, in a I think in my opinion, in a nice way how uh, all these effects that you have in, a, in the, in the, in the uh, dissipative realm, you may have it also in superconductors, structures, uh, but now it's in a non-dissipative world. So, and this is where what brings me to this uh, uh, anomalous phase that maybe you have heard about these phi knot junctions and we will see that this is nothing but the spin galvanic effect in the superconducting state, or at least we one can interpret this as, as such. And at the end, if I have some, uh, some uh, additional time, I will, uh, this part of the talk mainly focus on intrinsic spin orbit coupling, let's say Rashbat type, or uh, in general due to some, some uh, lack of symmetry of your system, but also um, we have more recent uh, discussed the case that the spin orbit coupling is due to uh, heavy impurities, for example. So what we call, I call here extrinsic spin orbit coupling. And um, one slide, because I know that here there are a lot of works working on ballistic systems, just to show the connection of our, um, our approach to ballistic system, how we can also give some, make some predictions on this. But this is really uh, something I did for this conference uh, last week, just it's, let's say under construction this part. It's one slide. So, this doesn't work. Okay, so let us now move to the beginning of maybe uh, what I consider the beginning maybe of this uh, superconductivity and uh, uh, pure spin dependent fields. In that case, uh, the studies of the paramagnetic susceptibility, we know nowadays very well that at zero temperature, um, superconductors or a BCA superconductor is, uh, is, is, uh, has no. Uh, the susceptibility is zero, so it's no response to this. Then by increasing the temperature, we know that we, we, we get up to the, uh, this is the normal, this is the critical temperature, so you get, we, we get the normal um, uh, paramagnetic susceptibility, the Pauli susceptibility. However, also in the 60s, Abrikos of Agorkov demonstrated that if you have some uh, spin orbit coupling, in that case, in that work was what I call here extrinsic, so impurities, have impurities, you may just uh, have a finite uh, spin susceptibility even at zero temperature and later on, much later on, Rashvan Gorkov showed that also if you have a 2D uh, uh, superconductor with a Rashva like spin orbit coupling, you may also have a uh, uh, zero temperature susceptibility. Moreover, and of course the system now is a 2D so it's different if you apply the field perpendicular that in plane so you have, so these, these prefactors are different in this calculation. So then uh, in order to, to understand this and uh, introduce, let's say, the maths of behind of what I will show you, I need then to introduce this object that probably most of you know, which is the Gorkov the anomalous green functions that describes two particles uh, correlations and obeys this uh, Gorkov equation. We prefer to work with this uh, uh, Gorkov equations. Uh, in that case, I show you here the, the Gorkov equations. This is, is as, as anomalous green function, it's a normal green function. 
in uh, homogeneous superconductors, let's say we assume, we have, we ha we assume that we have a Seaman, effect, a Seaman field which is homogeneous, then you can immediately solve this problem and you get then this type of solution. What is interesting for us here is that these this correlators, and this was already in the work of, of, of this 60, in the 60s, so that these correlators have, let's say you can write it as a sum of what I call the, the singlet part, and we have also here a triplet part. And now, uh, just to make a contrast to the triplets we heard in, in the old talks before, these are S-wave, no? This is a completely uh, isotropic system. So this is our S-wave triplets, and hence has to be odd in the, in the Matsubara frequency. And these are these this pair, uh, this pair correlations, triplet pair correlations. Now, if we <coughs> think on this maybe in, in a in systems that we have been studying in the last years, uh, hybrid systems combining superconductors and ferromagnets. Again, now this uh, small f here denotes that uh, we have really a metal diffusive, so we are just keeping only the isotropic part of these functions respect to the momentum. So we, uh, it is well understood that now these correlations may be induced due to proximity effect in the superconductor, and this uh, triplet vector is always parallel to the local magnetization. So yeah, I'm just talking about a completely diffusive system, so isotropic part of the green function. And if the ferromagnet has kind of different domains, then there will be different components of this triplet, and this is what we call here in this talk the triplet vector. And the goal of the talk is to find the analogy, as I say, between the singlet and triplet coupling that we will find in this type of systems and the charge and spin coupling that you will find in normal system in which you have uh, spin-dependent fields. Okay, for that I uh, start then adding to my, to my Hamiltonian uh, a time reversal symmetry preserved field, which is in that case uh, as a spin orbit coupling. In principle we can assume uh, uh, any field here omega, and if we just uh, <coughs> think in, in the in normal metals, in diffusive systems, there are several works in which you can derive from this, from this Hamiltonian some kind of kinetic equation. From the kinetic equation, you can just derive diffusion equations, and then you have the, the spin diffusion equation which has this general form, or even without any derivation, you can just write this equation like this. And if you just look at this, what I call here this gradient or this torque, we make the gradient expansion, so the first, just only taking the first gradient expansion, so what we can write, of course, is a, is a relaxation tensor, which is in the literature known as jacobian perel relaxation, if you have a diffusive system. It might be anisotropic. So you can write also the first <coughs> term in gradient in, in spin, which is this precession term. Yeah. And of course, you may uh, assume also a coupling between the charge, N, and, and, and spin, which is what I call here the spin hole torque, and this we know leads to uh, all these effects that I mentioned before, so spin hole effects and Edelstein's effects and so on. <coughs> okay, so let us just check that what happens, for example, if we just first forget this, this, this uh, uh, spin charge coupling, just we keep only these terms, and then imagine just we try to solve these equations, are really simple to solve. We have now, imagine we, we inject here a spin, and it is diffuse, and then due to this, these two terms, it might just create a, a spin helix, which I think in the literature is called spin helix. So we create then spin textures in our system just due to the spin of the coupling. This is something that we know for years uh, can be exploited, for example, for transistors and fascinating ideas, theoretical ideas. Now, if we, uh, let's say, we forget about uh, all these uh, inhomogeneities, we think that we have a, a uh, in a homogeneous system and, and, and let's say an um, electric field or a charge current flowing into it. So we can forget all the, the gradients here. We can solve immediately this equation assuming that this C tensor is finite. So we get immediately a spin induced by a charge current and this is what to, today in the morning was introduced as the Edelstein effect in the literature. So uh, I exactly don't know why it's called the Edelstein effect. There are other papers before Edelstein that actually uh, predicted such a magnetoelectric effect. So I mentioned here some of them. Edelstein was 1990. 
But the idea of the Edelstein effect, once again, is just you pass electric current in a dissipative system, and you create a magnetization, out of the magnetization in your system. Then there is also the inverse, and of course we are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a dissipative media, so then we need, of course, to, 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 in a sense, to pump energy there, so you need the AC field to polarize your system and create, in that way, an electric current. And this, is, this coefficient here is the Edelstein conductivity, which is the, the, <coughs> the linear coefficient of this relation. So now, we move now to uh, superconductors, and in superconductors we also have a diffusion equation, which is the so-called Usadel equation, which describes uh, the diffusion of, uh, and this is the linearized Usadel equation, I show you here, describes the diffusion of these of this pair correlations, these Fs I showed you in the beginning. And if we have, let's say, a, a Siemens field, this was our first example, we immediately see from this equation that we get a coupling between the triplet and the cyclet, but this is not what, uh, uh, this will not create any of these magnetoelectric effects. So, uh, but in order to have this charge and spin coupling, we know that we need the spin of coupling, so let us start introduce the spin of coupling in the Usadel equation, the diffusion equation. And here, in order to do that, it's uh, nice and elegant uh, to introduce this, this, uh, this uh, <coughs> vector potential, as probably you have seen it several times. So then we have this appealing form of the, of the Hamiltonian now. And if, of course, I'm talking about a linear in momentum, this works only for linear in momentum spin orbit coupling. Later on, I will show you uh, some general spin orbit, I think. I, yeah, I think, yes, I have some slides about it. Nevertheless, what it's uh, here interesting is that at the end of, so we have a new symmetry, writing these things in that way, so that uh, this is gauge symmetry, so all observables should be uh, uh, expressed through the covariant combinations on either fields or covariant derivatives. So this is a way of checking that your calculations at the end are correct. Everything has to be, all observables have to be in terms of, of fields, so SU2 electric field or SU2 magnetic field or uh, the covariant derivatives. So the recipe to do uh, Usadel uh, equation covariant is very simple. First, if we neglect the single triplet coupling at the first order in the diffusion equation, we just substitute all derivatives by the covariant derivatives. We write it here. Then we expand this, this Laplacian, and we see we identified exactly the three terms I showed you before in the normal, in the normal state, which is just the precession and the diagonal Pereira relaxation uh, tensor. So in other words, if we understood the physics here, for example, for the spin helix, means that we just inject spin in one position of your normal metal and through the spin of it coupling, uh, uh, you form this spin helix. Now in superconductivity, you may create yeah, a triplet correlation, and this triplet will also uh, have, so to say, a helix structure in it. And, and what is interesting is that by rotating the spin, uh, the triplet, you may have uh, Long range, so the long range Josephson junctions, for example, if you put two superconductors separated by a ferromagnet and you create components which are, let's say, perpendicular to the local magnetization of the ferromagnet. Okay, and this is per se a topic that I don't want now to discuss here. So, what about the charge and spin coupling, which is the base of our old uh, magnetoelectric effect? For this, we need to <coughs> go in a higher order in our uh, diffusion equation exactly in the same way what, when you want to, for example, to introduce classically the, um, the ordinary Hall effect in, in, uh, in a kinetic formulation. So we need now, uh, this is the, now our Boltzmann-like equation, which is called the Eilenberg equation in superconductivity. Is, uh, and then you see here this term, which can be seen as the, let's say, SU2 Lorentz force, as I wrote here. Uh, and, uh, and now what this term, this term tell us is that we have now a uh, deflection of trajectories as spin dependent. Yeah. And this is exactly what we are looking at. And in the normal systems, you will have exactly the same type of term. Yeah. And this will lead to this spin hole-like effect. Here, this term, what is interesting, this was our previous uh, Siemens field. You see that uh, this Siemens field, as we understood, coupled the singlet and the triplet. Yeah, but breaking time reversal. Now we have a new coupling, the single triplet, yeah, but, no, but it's now time reversal even. So then 
in summary, just showing here, what we, we get is uh, two ways just to transform singlets into triplet, okay. one through a uh, Siemens field, one through this uh, uh, spin orbit coupling. So uh, then it's simple. These equations are really uh, nice. I, I mean, solving these equations is really uh, a simple task. One is able to uh, solve this and show, let's say, for a more simple case, you have a homogeneous system. And let's, you have a phase gradient, so you have a supercurrent in your system. So it's very simple to calculate the, the Ehlers-Tag coefficient in the superconducting case. And now, of course, we are in a superconducting state. We have a, a non-dissipative system. Supercurrents are equilibrium currents, so this re reciprocity is complete. So you only need to polarize, polarize your system in order to get a supercurrent flow. And this is what is just written in this, in this, in this square here. And um, what is also nice is that using the SU2 formulation, so you can, as I say in the beginning, you can formulate, put all in terms of the electric and magnetic field. So this is the current generated, yeah, but polarized in our system. And then since we, can, we have now uh, um, a gauge uh, that we can just change our gauge, for example, this can be the electric field of this type can describe either a speed orbit coupling which does not commute with your Siemens field or some, as we know, some uh, magnetic texture yeah, that may generate this. So we, with a magnetic, magnetic texture, you also will be able to create these supercurrents. So all can be, this can be read from this uh, nice formulation. And now the next step is pretty simple. So we understand in a bulk system we have the Ehlerstein effect. Now imagine we make, a, 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 we construct a junction as a Chosserson junction, two superconductors, and let's say some non-superconducting material here. Usually, this is the Chosserson current phase relation. Now, if we assume that in this region we have spin orbit coupling and Siemens term, so, so we may expect to have some supercurrent, even if the phase difference between these two superconductors is zero. This is what people denote as finite junction. So a spontaneous current should flow here if we close this this in a loop, yeah, given by IC sine of phi naught. So and this phi naught can again, <coughs> using this formalism I showed you before, you can, it's very straightforward to calculate this phi naught function. And we understand now, if we see here exactly the same factors, we have the electric field and the magnetic field, and we see exactly the same structures as the Ehlerstein effect, means that, or the inverse Ehlerstein effect, so creation of a current by polarizing the system. So it means that the final junction and spin galvanic effects are one and the same effect for us in, the, in, 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 in this context. Of course, the difference is that in here we have dissipative physics. Here it's completely equilibrium thermodynamic currents, supercurrents. <coughs> so, and here's an example because we did it this for a generic spin orbit coupling, linearly momentum, but any, any spin orbit coupling. But if we just place the Rashba Dressel house just as an example, you see that uh, this is the current is proportional to this factor, which is nice to see if you are able to, to tune one of these. You can just tune this spontaneous current flowing in your, in your loop form here. No? So this is the it's an, a, a neat effect, if it can be. So, uh, <coughs> Okay, so far I have then uh, formulated this uh, for uh, intrinsic spin orbit coupling. Now imagine that you have a material that may happen, for example, this, the discussion platinum, what kind of spin orbit and other materials, what is the origin of spin orbit coupling. Imagine now we have a material which is spin orbit coupling stems from impurities. Right? So it's just, this is the random potential of impurity, so we have a homogeneous system, impurities, and there is this term with describing spin orbit coupling. So then, uh, in order to derive kinetic equations here, it is crucial here to write uh, this collision integral correctly, up to the order, of course, consistency up to the order you want to study effects. And in order to get the magnetoelectric effects, now we have to uh, discuss different uh, self energies within the Born approximation first. One can go beyond Born, but let me just show you Born effect. So we have, of course, the usual uh, uh, momentum relaxation term. 
Then we have the spin relaxation, which is actually what Abrikos of Angorkov did only. He only took the diagonal uh, turns, so uh, spin orbit, spin orbit uh, type of diagrams. This is also called Elliot Yafet in literature in spintronics. Um, it leads to spin relaxation. But of course, in order to, to get the, the coupling between charge and spin, you need to take the mixed diagrams. And this gives uh, uh, us this uh, so-called side jump uh, type of um, side jump um, uh, scattering. And uh, also this uh, spin current swapping that I will not uh, refer to here too, which is also a, an effect occurring in normal metals uh, predicted by Diakonov 2010, I think. So if we just put this all together and we get then at the end to our uh, uh, diffusion-like diffusion -like equation for the, for the superconducting correlations, we see that all the information, all the coupling you know, between singlet and triplet, which means charge, and, 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 and spin in the language of normal metals appears only at the boundaries. And this is clear. We have a homogeneous system. Infinite system should not, no. So there is this translational invariance. Nothing should happen. But as soon as we put a boundary and we just put a conservation of current, uh, or, uh, so no current flowing out of the system, or conservation of current, we get these red terms here. And this is exactly where this single triple conversion occurs. And there, Using these formulas, we can, for example, uh, predict very easily. So there are just a few lines of, of calculations that if you just pass a, a, a supercurrent in a thin superconducting film, you may accumulate spin uh, at the edges. Or vice versa, or sorry, or if you just break the, the translational uh, symmetry of the system, put in another type of metal, non superconducting, you will also create here. Uh, uh, a spin density in the normal metal. And of course, the inverse effect, which is maybe more interesting and simpler maybe to detect, is that if you have again your Josephson junction and you are able to apply an uh, in-plane magnetic field, you should be able to create again this anomalous supercurrent, which in this model is proportional to the spin hole angle and the, the value of the exchange field, if you want, if it's a ferromagnet or the Seaman field. And this is actually, uh, also which is proportional to the anomalous hole conductivity. So it means that any material showing anomalous hole conductivity, one slide, uh, will also show this. Uh, in the, if, if, you, if you make a justice on sanction with an, uh, a material showing anomalous hole conductivity, it should also be able to, to observe circulating supercurrents in this. So now, as I say, just uh, a remark. Uh, if uh, what I show you for the intrinsic spin orbit coupling, you may say, okay, come on, you have only uh, these anomalous currents only if you have a finite magnetic field, so, but SU2 magnetic fields. But it means that in the pure 1D case, you will say you don't have any magnetic field. No, it's true. So our semi classics in that case is very dangerous. So it's better to keep all at the level of Gorkov equations and just look at the symmetries. And what is the object that you can construct with exactly the same symmetry as the current? The minimal object in the fields, let's say perturbation in the field that you can construct. And what we found is that is this one. This is the SU2, the, the covariant time derivative of SU2 electric field, which is of course finite in one dimension, and multiply with the spatial derivative of it. And if I just put, that is really the, the last <laughs> formula. If you just plug here, let's say for 1D Rashva, as an exercise, <laughs> you obtain this formula that probably you know pretty well. So the field might not be neither parallel nor perpendicular uh, to the spin orbit coupling, uh, as an example. OK, so realization, possible realization of measurements of this not phase, but I don't go in this, so I will come to the conclusion. And thank you very much. Thank you.